The year is 1066, a crucial year in English history. Three kings and their armies will fight to the death and only one will be victorious. The victor will obtain the rich lands of England and will shape history forever. Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of this four-part series. Hello everyone, we're VC3 Productions, and if you'd like to check out part two to this video and see future videos on this series, why not head over to our channel? Thanks, Hilbert. I'd also like to take this quick opportunity to say that the advertising revenue from this video is going towards the Alzheimer's Research Society. If you'd like to donate, there's in the bottom section, comment section thing below. Um, and if you could share this with other people, then every view that this gets is helping that. So I thank you all very much for that. And and without further ado, let's get on with the 1066, the rise and fall of the North Sea Empire. To understand why three kings are contending for such a valuable throne, we need to head back to way before 1066. The structure of Anglo-Saxon England placed the king at the top of society above everyone else. Below him were the Anglo-Saxon earls who owned earldoms. Below the earls came the thanes who protected the earls' lands and held land of their own by royal charter. And at the bottom of the hierarchy were the peasants, and even below those were the serfs or slaves who had no rights at all. In between these ranks were freemen like craftsmen, blacksmiths and merchants. At the time, England was a very stable country as it had its own coinage system. Yet these precious metals were minted and exchanged every five years, which meant the king could enforce taxation and law and raise large sums of money. However, this structure of society made England a valuable target for foreigners. In the year 978, Ethelred II ascended to the throne of England and married a young woman named Emma, who was the daughter of the Duke of Normandy. They had several children, Edmund, Edward and Alfred, all of whom had a direct bloodline to the royal house of Wessex, the kingdom that had fought off the Vikings a century before. As King Ethelred the Unready was all, by all accounts incompetent weak ruler and a poor judge of character. He failed the deal with the consistent Viking attacks, but there is no evidence that his nickname the Unready was used during his time. Instead, his name in Old English Ethelred means wise counsel, and Unrad means bad counsel, so really his name means wise counsel, but poorly counseled. The Viking raids were not simply for plunder, but coordinated attacks with coordinated armies, often led by the King of Norway, Olaf Tryggvason, and the King of Denmark, Svein Forkbeard. Ethelred tried to keep the Vikings at bay by paying them large sums of money known as Danegeld, but he did not use this piece to fortify his country. He even tried to employ some Vikings to protect him, but when he was betrayed he ordered every last Dane in England killed. One of those Danes happened to be the sister of Svein Forkbeard, the King of Denmark, and revenge may have been the motive for his all-out conquest. By 1011, 15 shires of England had been laid waste to, and a year later Canterbury Cathedral was looted and the Archbishop murdered. More Vikings returned, demanding ever greater sums, and he was forced to pay £158,000 of silver in 1013. Soon Svein Forkbeard launched an invasion of England, and Ethelred fled to Normandy, allowing a successful invasion and conquest. However, his success would be short-lived as Svein Forkbeard died just five weeks later. His son Knut was proclaimed king, but when Ethelred and his family returned, he retreated. After regaining the throne, the royal family set about strengthening their position. Anyone who had sided with the Danes in 1014 was punished. The two thanes of Morcar and Seafirth, who owned land in Derbyshire, were killed and their possessions seized, and Edmund Ironside even took Seafirth's wife for his own. Although Ethelred was crowned, he faced resistance from his eldest son, Edmund. This allowed Knut to return in 1015 and conquer most of England before the two reunited. Ethelred died in 1016, and Edmund faced Knut alone, but surprisingly fought off the might of the Danes in five gruesome battles, only to lose in battle at Assendum, known in modern English as the Battle of Ashington. Edmund was considered to have shown great courage as a warrior and was allowed to live in Wessex. However, he only lived a few more months and Knut moved in to seize Wessex and became king of all England, Denmark and for a short time Norway, founding the North Sea Empire. Despite having fought tooth and nail against one another for years, Knut honoured his fallen adversary on the anniversary of his death. As Knut was a wise and successful ruler, although only newly converted to Christianity, he protected the church, which Vikings had so recently ravaged. It's not surprising that Knut was accepted as the English king, as Scandinavian settlements since the 9th century had created a culture that considered itself Anglo-Scandinavian in many parts of England, especially in the formerly Danish territories of the north and east. 
The highly disciplined ranks of the Danish house cars that Knut and his father Sven Folkby had employed also helped to keep control over the local population. It's even been argued by historian Susan Reynolds that during this time this elite and quintessentially Norse bodyguard unit actually had English members among the Danes, further integrating the armed forces and culture of the North Sea Empire. It's certainly true that even after the nominally Danish control over the Kingdom of England ended, that the Anglo-Saxon King retinues retained the mailed ranks of the housecarls who were among the elite troops present at the Battle of Hastings decades later. Knut also guaranteed safety from other Viking raids and split England into four earldoms. Following his conquest, Ethelred's widow Emma was anxious to regain her position as queen, and Knut took Emma as his second wife, leaving her two remaining children in exile in Normandy. During Knut's reign, Emma was always more loyal to her Danish family than her Anglo-Saxon ones in exile. She even bore Knut a new son, Hartha Knut. Unsurprisingly, Edward and Alfred felt increasingly bitter towards their mother. However, she felt she may have done them a favour protecting them from across the channel. Very little is known about Edward and Alfred's life in Normandy, but in 1035, the death of Knut plunged England into dynastic uncertainty. Knut's crown was disputed between his two sons, Harold Harefoot of his first marriage and Hartha Knut, his second marriage with Emma of Normandy. At this point, two Anglo-Saxon earls were of paramount importance. They were Leofric of Mercia, who supported the claim of Harold, and Earl Godwin of Wessex, who supported Hartha Knut. Unfortunately for Emma, Harold Harefoot was elected as king by the Anglo-Saxon council called the Witan. She fled to Flanders, as it was a strategic point between Hartha Knut, who was ruling in Denmark, and her exile family in Normandy. Hartha Knut was reluctant to leave Denmark, fearing his rival Magnus of Norway would seize his lands, so she wrote a letter to her sons in exile, encouraging them to return to England. The two brothers set sail to England and met with Earl Godwin upon their arrival. In spite of his welcome, Godwin blinded Alfred to death, and Edward managed to flee safely back to Normandy, avoiding any further conflict. It's unclear whether Godwin was following orders for the new king or seeking to gain his favour, but this event certainly filled Edward with rage. Harold Hereford died in 1040, so Harfa Knut was able to consolidate rule quickly with the help of Emma. However, his reign would be short-lived. Upon his death in 1042, another dynastic dispute emerged, but this time Edward finally managed to succeed to the throne. Edward sailed to England with his close friends Ralph of Mont and Robert de Jumier. Despite this foreign support, Edward had very few supporters within England itself, and very little was known about Edward throughout the country because he had spent so many years of his early life growing up in the Norman court. He needed support in order to succeed as monarch, so he had to turn to Earl Godwin of Wessex, who had close ties to the Witan. Still recalling his brother's death, Edward reluctantly took Godwin's support, as he was undoubtedly the most powerful earl in the kingdom. Edward's advantages were that he had a direct bloodline to the House of Wessex, and he had been raised as a knight in Normandy. Being a warrior was a strong trait and considered necessary for a ruler, given the constant border wars with the Scottish and the Welsh. Although almost all accounts portray Edward as a peaceful man, he succeeded as King of England in 1042 and was crowned with the help of Godwin. For the support in becoming king, Edward had to marry Godwin's daughter Edith. In addition, his two, his sons Harold and Swain, were given earldoms in the West Midlands and East Anglia. Edward was now indeed the King of England, but lacked any form of power base. There would be more trouble to come from within England during his reign, so stay tuned to find out how Edward went about ruling his new kingdom, and what the inconceivable consequences of his actions would spell for the future of the English people. Thank you very much for watching. This has been, of course, the road to 1066, the rise and fall of the North Sea Empire, going through the events of Svein Forkbeard and Ethelred, Edmund Ironside, the actions of Knut the Great, and then the dispute over the uh, dynastic succession after his death that eventually leads to Edward the Confessor coming to the throne. So in the next video, which will be up on VC3 Productions, as will the rest of this series on the road to 1066, he's going to delve into the reign of Edward the Confessor, which is crucial for the events of 1066 because he, in a way, this is the very much the foundation and then he goes on and adds in more Normans to the country and really sets up the dominoes that then fall in that climate year of 1066 with the Norwegians, the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans all vying for power in England at that time. So I have been History with Hill but I hope you have enjoyed this one. Do go and check out VC3 Productions and I hope you all have a fantastic day.